Please welcome Bill Gates. <laughs> to the show. Thank you. So everyone gets a million dollars, yeah? <laughs> I mean, you hear the cheers. Maybe a book. Maybe a book? Wow. <laughs> wow. Before we get into the book, let's talk about the news of the day, um, reproductive rights. This has been something that people have been fighting for in America for decades. It feels like now America's really rewinding time. I know that you have been one of the biggest donors to women's reproductive rights in America. When you look at the work you're doing and when you look at what we can do to keep improving that and, and, and create that bastion, what are some of the things we can do? Well, first of all, this is a worldwide struggle. Uh, there's a lot of countries that you know, have never had these rights. It's strange to have the U.S. go back. But uh, our foundation does a lot on getting contraceptives out. Uh, some people even fight against that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my dad ran the, chaired the local Planned Parenthood. Uh, so, you know, the idea of choice seems pretty basic. Um, mostly you, you think it's forward progress, not, not one step backwards. Not one step back. It was one small step for the Supreme <laughs> Court, one giant leap back for all women in America. Um, let's talk about the book. Bill Gates, How to Prevent the Next Pandemic. Why are you saying there's gonna be a next pandemic, Bill? Uh, <laughs> Why are you putting that juju on us? <laughs> well, the risk is always there. We actually were pretty lucky that we won 100 years without a really terrible pandemic. 1918, Spanish flu, mm -hmm. now COVID. And we shouldn't expect it'll be that long next time. Uh, it's not that hard to get ready. Um, you need to drill like you do for fire. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got, you know, 300,000 firemen in the U.S. We've got 9 million fire hydrants. Uh, and a lot less than that would make it so we wouldn't have to suffer uh, another pandemic. Before we get into the, you know, the future of it all, let's talk about the past. Uh, you know, I, I like how you lay out in the book what to do to prevent the next pandemic. You gave a TED talk a while ago talking about basically what we just went through over the past two years, and then people blamed you for creating it, because mm -hmm. that's how things work. If you say it, it happens. It's the secret. I've, I've read it. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I... I found myself reading the book and I was fascinated, but I was going, but shouldn't we also be interested in how this pandemic came to be? Like, like it, it's still shrouded in so much mystery. It's like, well, how do we prevent something where we don't even understand how it came to be? Like, you know, are there labs where they need to do better at, at, at you know, enclosing the work that they're doing? I understand that they have to do the work, but how do we figure that out and how do we move forward in, the, in that realm? Well, we shouldn't be careful about lab safety it's quite clear in this case that it came across through animals. Mm -hmm. And almost all our diseases, like HIV, crossed over from chimpanzees in Africa quite some time ago. Ebola came from bats. Uh, this also, uh, with one step in between, came uh, from bats. So it's going to keep happening, particularly with climate change, where we're invading uh, a lot of habitats. Uh, and you want to catch it as soon as you can. How do we do that? Well, you see people getting sick, uh, you, you see uh, elevated deaths, and you go in there and you actually take and you sequence it early on. Uh, and then you have a global group right. that is ready to go, kind of like a fire squad, uh, comes in and very quickly you diagnose people. Uh, some countries have had a tenth the deaths of the United States because they were a little bit more ready Right, uh, right, right. And, you know, so, boy, we learned a lot in this pandemic. I mean, in 2015, yes, the warning was there, but now we, uh, we know a lot more, and it's obvious, pretty obvious what should be done. You talk about this global squad in, in the book. I think you, you've referred to it. It's, it, it could Germ. you say the name? Germ, G-E-R-M, Global Epidemic Response and Mobilization. Why, why would you call it Germ, though? Why would, like, <laughs> if, if, like, if I need help, I wouldn't call, like, Germ to come and help me. Why call it Germ, though? That might... Okay, I'll, I'll give up the name as long as it gets funded. Okay, fine. <laughs> All right, fine. <laughs> so, so explain it to me a little bit, you know, because it seems like what you're trying to create is almost like a, you know, like an interplanetary space force, but you're trying to do that for Earth, for our diseases. Isn't there going to be a limitation in how much can get done because the governments themselves may get in the way? Like, China was a perfect example. 
they knew before people knew. They tried to do their best, and they were like, we're going we're gonna to handle this. They couldn't handle it. And that was crucial time that the world lost in trying to prepare themselves. So wouldn't germ be at the mercy of any particular nation? Yeah, we may have lost you know, two or three weeks if China had uh, both domestically and globally talked about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some countries, even so, that was enough time because they had practiced and they did diagnostics very uh, quickly. Okay. Um, the next outbreak is, I'd say, equally likely to come out of a, a country in Africa where you don't have a very strong health system. So they won't try and cover it up. But unless you have uh, a little bit of data gathering and a group to fly in, you may take even longer to get the alarm bells ringing than we had this time. So germ will help the uh, poor countries a lot, which is where a lot of the risk is. A lot of people have asked this question, I mean, through the pandemic, don't get me wrong, there were crazy takes, but some people asked what, in my opinion, was a valid question. They said, well, well why is Bill Gates the one who's talking about this? I mean, if we want help with computers, we know we're gonna call you, but <laughs> why are you the person who's writing books about a pandemic or talking about a pandemic? Is it because you're a billionaire or what gives you that right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, my full-time job is uh, at, at the foundation now and we work on infectious diseases all the time. And pandemics, you know, you have to have people who know about vaccines and diagnostics and therapeutics and communications. Well, I was lucky enough for the last two years as we put an extra two billion into trying to stop this pandemic mm -hmm. that I was listening to them and understanding, okay, we should have done this, we should have done that. So there's, no, there's amazing experts that I love working with. There's no one who kind of could make it simple. Uh, and so my goal, like with my climate book, was to elucidate it in a way that would be quite straightforward. I see. So you talk to the experts, and then you go like, you guys speak gibberish. I'm going to write it down in a way that people can understand. It makes sense. That's really, the goal. I mean, that's like the graphical user interface. That's the whole idea. Get us away from it. Um, <laughs> it really is. That's what it is. We are barely coming out of this pandemic. What are some of the small things, just tiny things that we could put in place that would help us prevent or delay or eliminate altogether another situation that decimates the entire globe? Well, it's too bad that we don't have trusted people who are saying, raise the vaccination level. I mean, this pandemic could still surprise us with another variant. And oh, so boy. getting uh, particularly elderly people uh, to not only be vaccinated, but to be boosted you know, that can't be said loudly enough. Um, one thing I'm excited about is we will be able to have diagnostic machines to very rapidly test people. That, we really bungled that this time. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And once those first 100 days go by, it's hard uh, to make up for that. Uh, and so one of the cheapest things in here is getting those amazing breakthrough diagnostic machines out, not just in the US, but uh, in the entire world. And that's a big thing that you've been an advocate of, is um, creating a, a fairer system of getting technology and resources out to the world. I mean, you were one of the first people who complained about vaccines not going to Africa and not getting it out to the people who needed it. How do we change perspectives on that? How do you convince European or Western countries that they need to spend some of their money getting some of this equipment to help test people in Africa? Yeah, the inequity on this has been quite severe, whether it's within the country who mm -hmm. suffered the most or globally, uh, you know, who was last in line for the vaccines, the, the poor countries. If we, you know, can make it cheap enough, if we can have the capacity, uh, put those factories in more places all over the world, uh, then we'll have equity. You know, I was a little surprised during the epidemic, people are like, oh, you know, saying, hey, we didn't get the vaccines there. Well, we have health inequity with all sorts of diseases. Mm -hmm. This isn't, you know, this is day in and day out. We have inequity. But it's nice that this reminded them about infectious diseases. Oh. So, you know, I'm talking to governments all the time about, hey, let's give more uh, and help out and lift these countries up. Uh, there's a lot of distractions out there. Budgets are super tight. I hope that cause uh, keeps in people's minds and may, remains a priority. But uh, fighting for those budgets will probably be tougher in this next year than ever before. Well, it's a fascinating book. Thank you so much for joining us on the show again. Good to see Great you. Great to see you. Thanks. Those books, How to Prevent the Next Pandemic, is available now.